to put into words what you're mentally going through. Uh, mushrooms just was like a big, uh, man, there were times that I felt literally um, uh, my brain, like little uh, doorways opening up and just like fluid, like just made me new, uh, you know, brain waves and just like, you know, like just flowing in my brain. And I felt like, man, this is such like brain food. It's a lot of colors. I always see colors. Um, what it mostly does is it turns, I like to call it is your vision goes from three megapixels to 300 megapixels. Like vision is just, everything is so vibrant. You're, you're very much in the moment. Everything is alive. I always tell people doing a psychedelic experience. I've never done it, but I got bros that skydive. <laughs> so it'd be like skydiving, but instead of going down, you're going up. <laughs> if, if people can understand that. <laughs> what does it feel like to you? <laughs> Uh, to me, it feels very, um, it feels very liberating, very liberating because when I'm in these constructs, they're very, they're very, uh, I wouldn't say like problematic, but they cause problems. They cause more problems than they do solutions. So when I'm in a, you know, ceremony and taking medicine, it's like it liberates me from all the problems that men and women have put on this earth. Many psychedelic drugs are illegal worldwide, with occasional exceptions for religious use and research. Despite this, the recreational use of psychedelics is very common. Doing these drugs recreationally is a really good time, but there's anecdotal experiences that make you think that some sort of more profound thing might be happening here. So the psychedelics change how you think and they switch off parts of your brain that can make you depressed? So I started using marijuana when I was about 22 years old. I started using it because I started dialysis for the second time in my life. When I was 15, I, I went and was on dialysis for about three years uh, before I got a kidney transplant. The biggest problem I was having was death anxiety. And I came so close to dying on dialysis so many times that it just, penetrated all my thoughts. I'd wake up every morning thinking about dying, thinking, oh my God, I didn't die in my sleep, and then I'd have a panic attack, or is today the day I'm gonna die? And it just, it, it followed me everywhere, and it seems to be kind of a thing that happens to people when they get sick young in life and they survive it. People who have cancer will then go on to have really deep death anxiety. My friends kind of let me know that to help me with this PTSD I was having that I could use LSD and and I tried it and that anxiety went away completely it was it was like turning off a light switch and I can't really explain it you know it it, it touched on something deeper than like talk therapy or Prozac or any of those things it, it it hit me in a place where it just wasn't a problem anymore and I decided that I wasn't gonna let anybody make me feel bad for feeling good in the projects, nobody really had any of that stuff. Like there was no acid, no mushrooms, there was no ayahuasca, no peyote, no DMT, none of that stuff was there whatsoever. It was all cocaine, heroin, crack, methamphetamine, you know, these terrible, terrible things. Psychedelics weren't there. Those are inspiring tools. Once you use those things, you utilize, you see that either you find a way out of the problem that you're in, you face your problems, you become accountable to your steps in life and those things. And I feel like that's just not what's happening in low financial situations. I was like 35 years old the first time I ever decided that I wanted to take psychedelics and my reason for taking psychedelics was because I wanted to overcome some mental problems that I was going through due to some horrible circumstances that life had thrown upon me. I had gone through my mother passing away through cancer and being her caregiver so therefore I felt completely overwhelmed with life and then within a week and a half later my wife who I was married to was killed in a tragic car accident that kind of sent me into a complete utter depression because my two rocks that I had keeping my whole life together were gone although I wanted to be happy I couldn't find any means to do it it was very um, false. I would smile to fake it till I make it. And I was not doing well at that. 
I had been told by many people in my uh, peer group at the time that you could take micro doses of LSD or micro doses of mushrooms. It'd be very beneficial to resetting the mind and allowing yourself to um, overcome obstacles that you were snagged upon maybe mentally. I believe they increase your awareness because like I said, in modern times, you don't have that time to like fully connect. Like for instance, if I had to work all day and then I had to go do something else and do something else, I couldn't have time to just sit out here and breathe and look at the, the hawks, the birds, whatever, flies, anything I wanted. Because by the time I get home and be so burnt out that I just want to have some food, take a shower, go to bed, you know, and, and repeat, you know, because I'm constantly working. So uh, definitely I believe they allow you to see it. And like I would say, a microscope, like a scientist to a microscope. You look at that microscope and then after that you go to work. You don't just sit on the microscope and like geek out all day and night. So like whatever you use this to, to, to examine, then after that you go to work on whatever you examine. And that, so that can range from addictions to to behavior problems, to traumas, you name it. Like I said, it's whatever you want to work on. You know, you don't have to take on your whole traumas at once. It's hard. You know, I've tried it myself and ended up melting. So it's like, you, you got to pick what you need and, and it's okay to take your own pace. You know, it's, it's your healing, you know, take care of yourself, you know. That's the beauty of psychedelics. It is, you know, it's just going to really expedite growth and healing. And I've experienced that. A lot of people have experienced that. There's a certain percentage of the population that's going to hear psychedelic drugs are having medicinal benefits, and they're just going to think, oh, this is maybe placebo, or that this is a misunderstanding or correlated evidence. Maybe it's not directly caused by the psychedelic drugs, but just something associated with them. But what we're learning now is that with these mainstream studies, these places are, are starting to find out that these anecdotal statements that recreational users have made all throughout time are actually based on real science. And the facts are showing that authentic healing is happening when people are taking these drugs. I had talked to a couple friends and um, they were like, you should really try mushrooms. It'll reset you. And I didn't even know what reset meant, but I felt like, I I needed it. I was like, I need something better than what I have. And any other option other than mushrooms that was, was like given to me, I was completely petrified and afraid of because I had heard horrible things happening taking all these different um, antidepressants. And I was afraid that if I get on these types of medications that I'd end up dying like my mom from stomach cancer due to the medications that she'd been on her whole life. and and or, you know, just going through some horrible things and having to take all these pills for the rest of my life. And I just wanted to feel better. I took I, a very, I wouldn't say micro dose, but I took like a gr gram of mushrooms and never felt better. And I haven't looked back and I haven't been sad since I've done that. As far as not being able to pull myself out of the depression. It, it literally resets something. I do feel sad. I have moments of sadness, but I don't feel like I stay in any type of stuck place like I used to. I just feel like doing that, it, it brought, um, it took the veil off of my eyes and it showed me that there was another way that I didn't even see was there before. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veli now. And it's the it's the the warm blanket that's given me comfort when nothing else could. Someone who has experienced um, combat trauma, if you look at the neuroimaging and you compare to, for example, a little girl that has experienced very traumatic things that occurred to the body the detrimental effects is mirrored. And so PTSD is PTSD, even if what from the outside, you might think that there are different degrees, you know, for example, being in, I don't know, Afghanistan and watching the horrendous things that occur, or maybe it's just, you know, someone made fun of me at school one day. You know, it's the way you perceive things that is could be equivalent trauma. The emotional impact that it has on me now, it's I, I, 
I understand when, you know, you hear about people in the 60s wanted to do all they could to get everyone to try it. And there's, it, it feels like life before was a small piece of this pie. I'm not going to try to rank my traumas with anybody, but um, like, for instance, uh, I watch CNN and they talk about psychedelics and the guy was like, oh, yeah, you know, all my depression gone. And I'm like, OK, like. Like I lost my father, like I've been through a lot of things and I've done this medicine a lot, over 20 grams plus a lot, a lot of times. And I can sit here and tell you right now that I'm not fully healed, like that I still hurt for my dad and my family. And I can sit here and say for sure, psychedelic medicine has helped with the path of my father, my own traumas and my own addictions. Yeah, that's so true. But to sit here and say it cured it all, I'd be lying to you and myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Studies conducted using psilocybin in psychotherapeutic settings reveal that psychedelic drugs may assist with treating depression and alcohol addiction. But further research is still needed. I don't think that any drug can give you knowledge. That's just beyond the scope of what a drug can do. But they, they can certainly make you feel different. I think people can definitely get insights into other people and into the insights into themselves um, from psychedelics, but that's not the main benefit of them. I, I feel so stunted a lot of the time with the various things that I was born with being, you know, blind in one eye. I have one kidney, I'm missing two vertebrae. I, I you know, we talked about uh, I, my perception of the world is in two dimensions. I only have one eye. I'm monoocular. So I when I take LSD, I feel like I can perceive more of the world. When I look at a tree, I'm not just looking at a tree anymore like I do every day in my life. I'm looking at every leaf. I'm looking at the birds on the tree. I'm looking at the bark, the branches, everything, and I can take it all in. And it feels like sometimes in life, you get bogged down by a lot of BS that doesn't matter. You know, they say it's hard to not sweat the small stuff. When it's all small stuff, you're going to sweat it. And when you can take a drug that Let's everything kind of drop away. Let's all your problems just fall away like water. You know, why, why deny yourself of something like that? Legal barriers have made the scientific study of psychedelics difficult. However, research has been conducted and studies show that psychedelics are physiologically safe and do not lead to addiction. So my doctors will try and put me on, you know, antidepressants or benzodiazepines that have side effects that are worse than the problem that they're trying to cure. Whereas I can take one hit of very inexpensive LSD and the only side effect is maybe I'll sleep a lot the next day, which, you know, isn't any different than being depressed and is way less than a hangover. And, you know, or... I'll maybe be a little crabby from a serotonin depletion, but I, you know, I just prepare and I know how I'm going to react to these drugs and make sure, you know, you have the buddy system and you have somebody around who can, uh, who can guide you through if you're having a tough time. The early evidence is all looking good. Like I was saying before, it's consistent. It seems to be moving in the same direction. Various drugs are doing things slightly different but they all seem to be helping people with these problems. And mostly they are mental problems. Um, things like anxiety, depression. Doing these drugs seems to help people that have PTSD, that have trauma issues. Yeah, I've been around a lot of people that have had beautiful psychedelic experiences that have given, you know, healing. Is it a cure? No, it's not, you know, but it allows you to get your head above water, you know, so that you can build healthier habits so that when the symptoms come back, and they do, and they will, you'll be stronger and you have a support system there. You know, you've got your floaties on. It's a proud thing, you know, to say that, like, I was drowning. Did you see me back there? I was drowning, but I am still breathing today.
where I came from originally definitely didn't look like the path to being an active member of the psychedelic renaissance now in California and in the United States and in the world. I grew up in the country that no longer exists. At the time I was there, it was Yugoslavia and it ended up being a very tumultuous place that ended up in a civil war in the early 90s. That's where some of the first drug experiences happened in that traditional sense, where I was introduced to hashish primarily and uh, uh, cannabis, and then later on to some other substances that were both a part of uh, some of the party culture, but at the same time, due to the nature of, of some of the individuals that I was hanging out, which were prominent philosophers and artists, it was also viewed as something that was helpful with the consciousness expansion. So we actually did some very early meditation and breathwork techniques at that time. And I was only 15, 16, and I didn't quite understand how helpful and how wonderfully integrated those techniques are with the uh, psychedelic experiences. Prior to that, I actually did have um, experiences that were characterized as sexual abuse. I was always overly sexualized in that environment from a very early age. Even um, at the age of five, uh, I was a ballerina. I lived in a socialist environment as I remember one of the very first experiences where I became so acutely aware of my body form being scrutinized by this massive number of um, characters dressed in, dressed in gray suits, this whole Eastern European kind of look of the dignitaries and politicians because I had to dance as a ballerina for this big event which was a celebration of our dictator's birthday. Being in that uh, environment unfortunately did expose a woman like me at that time in the 70s and early 80s to multiple instances of sexual harassment and sexual abuse that I always had to be quiet about. I could never be vocal. I could never tell anyone about it. A little bit after that, uh, as I said, I started to uh, take some of the substances that were readily available in that environment. Some of those experiences have actually given me such relief and ease of accepting that environment around me that was highly sexualized, highly unsafe for a young woman like myself. And that was very hopeful, but at the same time, there was a big fear and shame attached to that. So I realized that I could not continue using them regularly, otherwise there would be bigger consequences. So with my use of LSD with PTSD, it's definitely helped me be more active. You know, when people are depressed, you become lethargic and when I had these things on my mind, these things that, you know, are preventing me from going out and living my life that are bogging me down, you know, when I take acid, I could be out and I could be active and doing things that I wouldn't normally be doing. You know, going out and spending days and days at the amusement park and having the time of my life with childlike wonder. Everyone should experience that once. To drop all of the thoughts of taxes and relationships and all the BS we deal with as adults and to have that childlike wonder again is priceless or $5. I mean, it, it's, it, you know, honestly, it's, I can't, I can't tell you how much energy I have for the months afterwards and the, the long-term effects of the use of, of any psychedelics of LSD, of DMT, of, you know, of mushrooms I've tried them all the the long-term effects of, of these to my psyche and to my emotional well-being and to to my self-care is astronomical and you really unmatched the psychedelic experience is often compared to atypical forms of consciousness such as those experienced in meditation mystical experiences and near-death experiences most known psychedelics activate the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor, although a few such as ketamine, salvia, and muscimol act on different neurotransmitter systems. Psychedelics are thought to induce a hyperplastic state where neurons more readily form new connections, allowing for deep learning. This makes the brain more receptive to new patterns of thinking and can especially 
be helpful for people suffering from psychiatric disorders. It's, it's all about the trodden trails of the mind. You know, it's like a hiking trail. The more times that you walk the hiking trail, the more deep it is gonna be. So it's really hard sometimes when you're out hiking to go off the trail. So let's say perhaps, you know, a dog were kicked over and over again. Then it's going to learn how to bite. It's protecting itself. Same goes for if a little girl when she was being raised, was told over and over again that she was stupid and that she was worthless, she is going to think that and she is going to protect herself in every way to hide that from people. Now that's the default mode network. Those are the protections that your brain has set up. They're trodden trails of the mind. They're the guard dog. Now we want the guard dog to sort of fall asleep for a little bit, you know, so we can see reality, so we can use logic and love to react instead of fear and programming. So, you know, that's where, you know, a lot of different modalities can come in. Psychedelics are the new thing, not really new, but the new hot topic, you know, psychedelics, one dose could change your life. You know, it can be, especially when it's paired with psychotherapy, you know, your hyperplasticity of your neurotransmitter system is going to be increased to the point of when your psychotherapist, or let's say your friend, let's say your family that is there supporting you through a psychedelic experience, and they're telling you, you are good, you are love, then you reform that pathway and you keep enforcing it. The classic psychedelics are LSD, DMT, mescaline, found commonly in cactus, and psilocybin, found commonly in mushrooms. I think one of the more promising psychedelics is DMT. You know, it's extremely close to psilocybin molecularly, um, but it doesn't act qu quite as long. So dimethyltryptamine is a tryptamine alkaloid that's common in a whole lot of plants. Grasses have it, even you know, the leaves of an orange tree have small amounts. You know, it's really close to the neurotransmitter serotonin, so it has very profound effects in humans. Eating DMT is a lot closer to psilocybin, but still pretty distinct. Uh, whereas smoking it is kind of like condensing a psilocybin trip uh, into, you know, just a, f a few minute window. Well, the MAO enzyme in your body will break down DMT. So uh, if you just eat pure DMT, nothing happens. But if you take an MAO inhibitor, like Syrian rue or the ayahuasca vine, uh, there's a lot of different MAO inhibitors. Then it stops the MAO from breaking down the DMT. So then it, it can just be eaten. Yeah, I do know about MDMA. You know, we have the MAPS trials that are going on currently. You know, Rick Doblin has formed this you know, foundation where they are working on nonprofit research. And they've been doing it for quite a while. And I believe that they've been inspired from people that have done it before and people that have gone through the trials. They're coming out changed. And you know, not everyone, it's not 100%, but it's enough for them to get their head above water and start to reframe the way that they see their reality you know, and start to build healthier habits that are then going to be, you know, their support system when they relapse again, because from what I've experienced is they will relapse. Psychedelics is really, you know, MDMA seems to be quite helpful with PTSD. MDMA, you know, puts you in such a euphoric love state that you know, you start to love yourself so much that you're like, what am I doing? You know, why am I hurting this vessel? What am I doing? And you stop all the, you know, unhealthy habits that you use to try to dissociate from that trauma, you know, whether it be, you know, gambling, pornography addictions, heroin addictions, alcoholism, so on and so forth, you know, you just come out of it and you're like, whoa. Peyote medicine is a really powerful medicine. 
uh, as peyote is not as I would say as hallucinogenic if that's the proper term if you want to use it like that uh, it, it still is a psychoactive medicine but I feel it's more of an internal thing it's more of a uh, like a like a, like a soul searching type of medicine where it does waken up your heart is really heart centering um, yeah you, you I, after a peyote ceremony you come out of teepee you really want to call up everyone and you're like hey i love you i go hey i'm, I'm sorry there was a jerk or whatever hey mom and dad i love you guys I just want to tell you i love you, you know like it's just like a, a euphoric feeling of just like almost like natural ecstasy or just bliss and just gratitude Everyone needs different drugs, and I think psilocybin cures all depression, treats depression for a lot of people, but definitely not everyone. There's no one drug that treats depression in everyone because there's so many different causes of depression and so many different uh, you know, things that are going on in your mind that can cause depression, and there's no way that one different, you know, like the psychotherapists they'll treat people they'll put them on a whole bunch of different medications and to find out which one actually works for them and they don't usually know beforehand which one will work for you and they you just got to try a bunch of them and one of them ends up maybe helping or maybe none of them do that's sometimes it's like that too um, a lot of people are working with psilocybin right now yeah johns hopkins and so that's where a lot of inspiration is coming from you know when I started coming out of the closet as, you know, a psychonaut scientist. Really, it was John Hopkins that inspired me to be brave. You know, they're doing the work. You know, especially for PTSD and, uh, you know, various, you know, psychological disorders. Um, it can be very helpful for people. You know, a lot of people go through like very mistrusting of other people and they just don't realize how good life can be and they'll take MDMA and they'll realize that, you know, see this completely other window into the people's souls and they'll be like, wow, people are not so t such terrible creatures after all. And even though it wears off in a few hours and then they don't feel different afterwards, um, just experiencing that can be very valuable. The effects of psychedelics are dose dependent. High doses are more likely to induce mystical experiences than low doses. These mystical experiences brought on by high doses appear to be particularly valuable, especially when combined with psychotherapy. You know, you always feel like you've only scratched the surface when you talk about psychedelics because there's such a variety of psychedelics and not all psychedelics are equally useful for everybody. I think it's very important for everybody who is considering using psychedelics to really do their homework or to work with people that, uh, that they trust in understanding the aspects of harm prevention and understanding the aspect of psychedelic exuberance. I definitely do want to mention that because that is a common thing that happened to a lot of people dabbling into psychedelics for the first time, that people get so excited and so overwhelmed with that experience. They're experiencing that, that ease with themselves and their place in the world for the first time. They're experiencing that oneness and connection for the first time. Coming from the place of loneliness and desperation, it's a powerful emotion, but it can also be very misleading to the point where I've seen people get so exuberant that they want to shout from the rooftops that psychedelics should be poured into waters <laughs> and fed to everybody. And that's where I kind of draw the line and go, understand that that's going to happen to you. And please be careful with how you relate that message. Despite all of the wonderful research that is available to us, despite lesser stigma that we're seeing in our society right now, psychedelic discrimination and the dangers of coming out of the closet and talking about this are real. They're still here. There's still a lot of work to be done. And the best thing we can do is talk about our personal experience, our personal healing, yet be careful not to try to really influence everybody or talk to absolutely everybody that we encounter about this. Again, choose your audience, pick your audience. It's just better strategy for now. Something that's really important to me is 
that we're mindful of every step that we make in the movement. I have a lot of fears about the steps that we take in the industry hurting the movement because we can't have a rollback. You know, we're in the renaissance right now in a very pivotal place, you know, with our global crisis that we're experiencing right now. And if we get too enthusiastic and we're blinded by the, the passion and the enthusiasm, we're going to make missteps. And that's going to be ammunition against the movement. We can't do that. So we have to do things very thoughtfully, strategically, mindfully. We you know, need to abide by the laws. We need to speak the language of our adversaries. For example, as I build methodologies, full FDA validations of all my methods. Do I have to do that? I do not. But I want to show everyone that we're doing things right. We respect the authorities, but we want to present a new idea. And, you know, when I got into mushrooms, you know, early 2000s, they weren't very popular. It was kind of a fringe thing. Um, people thought of them as something you find at concerts. And um, I was pretty surprised how it changed. Um, and I think it's a good thing that, you know, these changes have happened. People are recognizing their, uh, their use, you know, medicinally and spiritually. Um, but that's surprising to me. And I... You know, I was already on the path of be looking at these things before people started to notice them in, in mainstream culture. I can tell you some of the most recent things that has started to happen to me as I have started to come out of the psychedelic closet, especially over the last uh, several years. Just making posts on Facebook, on your social media, on Instagram, even the posts that are citing scientific research that has been conducted by organizations like Johns Hopkins that are talking about using psilocybin for the end of life distress, for, for treating signs of depression, PTSD and such, even those types of posts that are mentioning substances like psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin, or talking about LSD, which now we know is helpful for so many things, for pain, uh, for autism, for many, many other things. Even those types of po posts would cause children uh, from my daughter's school and their parents to publicly discuss inappropriateness of my posts and deem my daughter as possibly a troubled child and somebody they shouldn't associate with. The first memories that I have of, of really learning about drugs was from the D.A.R.E. program. I remember them saying at a certain point, people who did drugs weren't happy and that they were doing these drugs to fill this happiness that was missing from their lives. To me, that was really interesting. I didn't take away the message that I shouldn't do drugs. I took away that if I'm not happy, maybe drugs are the answer. Well, you know, the medicinal value is harder to quantify, but I'm sure it plays a role. You know, people that take psilocybin mushrooms, they notice they feel better the next day, the day after that. For weeks, months, even years afterwards, they feel more at peace. They feel more mental health or less annoyed by the annoyances of everyday life. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, depression is, is really common these days. I think most people suffer at least some depression in some parts of their life, and it, they seem to switch off the part of the brain that causes depression. Certainly those effects did not go unnoticed, though they weren't very well documented until recently. One of the things that you learn when you decide that you want to make a film about this kind of thing is that you have to start investigating the evidence and finding out what is authentic evidence and what is just urban legends, shall we say. There, there can be a, a big difference between the urban legends of psychedelic medicine and the authentic science of what is actually happening. So citizen science is uh, science that's done by regular people. You know, mushrooms are a really good thing to study with citizen science because there's not a lot of money in mushrooms. So uh, there's a lot of mushrooms to be discovered. So it's a field where just people that 
you know, just are kind of in interested in them, but don't necessarily have a lot of training, can make real contributions. You know, in California, we've been naming mushrooms for about 170 years. And just recently, we've started to do DNA analysis. Within the past 20 years, we've started to analyze the DNA of them. And we have names for most of the mushrooms, but it turns out those names are not correct. Most of them are from Europe or other parts of the world. And when you check the DNA, you realize the European ones are usually different, which means the California ones are left with no name. And anywhere in the world you go, there's so many mushrooms that don't have names. So just walking through the woods, maybe I'll see a hundred species of mushrooms, and at least a third of them won't have a scientific name yet. So there's a, a lot to be done. So I spend a lot of time in the woods, and when I find something, I take really nice pictures of it and upload the pictures to the citizen science mycology sites and then i collect them and bring them home and uh, do microscopy to figure out you know the spore size and all the microscopic details and dna sequencing um, so it you know, reads the dna molecules to figure out how they're all related and by putting all that together i get a pretty good picture of what it is that i found and photographed it's really hard to test for health benefits. Okay. Um, you know, mushrooms have a reasonable amount of protein, and that's um, that's certainly good. Um, there's a lot of mushrooms that are used for medicine in different ways, but there's not a whole lot of studies on it. They definitely work for some things sometimes, uh, but it's it's really hard to test. Um, so, for example, like lion's mane definitely seems to regrow neurons, and that's real promising. And I know people that had like traumatic brain injury and got pretty dramatic results um, healing themselves with lion's mane and uh, psilocybin. You know, the polypores like Ganoderma uh, definitely do something. Um, I think the only one that's really been proven to uh, help with cancer in humans is the Trimedes versicolor or turkey tail. Um, and there's, uh, there's some clinical trials on that that show that, you know, in real people with real cancer, they definitely help. Um, and then there's a lot of other ones that people take that are not tested so much. Um, like chaga is very popular and it does taste good. Uh, but there's not very many clinical trials. You can't find any clinical trials that say that chaga will help with cancer. Though there are some where they put uh, cancer cells in petri dishes and then you know the mushroom extract and saw that it inhibits it, which doesn't tell you that it cures cancer in people, but it does mean that it should be investigated. Larger picture, you know, one, you know, clinical studies, they laid the groundwork out for us. You know, the scientists are doing the work and the results are looking quite impressive, quite promising. Now, once, you know, some writers and celebrity scientists, what have you, who was able to spread the message, once they're like, okay, we've been in the closet for so long. Consuming psychedelics, as you know, are, is highly stigmatized. There's a reason why I'm in front of this camera right now, talking about it. You know, there's a reason why I was ostracized from my family. There's a reason why I quit working for the Department of Homeland Security, monitoring for bioterrorism, because I wasn't willing to give up these sacred medicines. And now it's time. From a personal standpoint, having a career as a scientist has made me more credible and legitimate when I say, hey guys, this is a thing that's helped me. I studied biology and it's really helped me a lot because it has made me into a renaissance woman where I know a lot of things and I can connect the dots. Lots of collecting and lots of measuring spores and looking at other microscopic features. And the microscopy is pretty hard because you're comparing thousands of random shapes with thousands of other random shapes in the literature and they sort of match up sometimes uh, sometimes better than other times so it's kind of it was it's kind of difficult a lot of guesswork and a lot very open to interpretation um, so with dna sequences there's a lot less guesswork there's still some because you have to interpret the sequence and decide what it means uh, but in most cases it's a whole lot more clear
you know, when we talk about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, when, you know, you're trying to increase neuroplasticity, you know, how malleable these trodden trails of the mind, you know, these neurotransmitter paths are established, you know, psychedelics can really assist and just hyper, you know, it's like you're on steroids, you know, get you to where you need to be. The first time I heard about this science with the psychedelic drugs and um, it kind of being authentic and showing real results, I was skeptical too. And I waited, I thought, oh, maybe we should wait and see like more studies. Maybe this is just like some sort of one, one time thing. And then we're gonna end up seeing that this evidence isn't repeatable or that there's some sort of um, something fishy going on with the studies. But no, that's not been the case. And it seems to be routine that places that are studying these are coming up with the same evidence and they're able to repeat these conclusions and these are also coming from different er, different countries different places different uh, political backgrounds all all of these things that should sway the evidence but the evidence is staying consistent i've read a lot of the studies and it's pretty clear that the most promising medicinal mushrooms are the psilocybin mushrooms and anybody who's taken them noticed that too like they feel drastically different not just when they take them but in the in the days weeks months that follow um, so i think those have more medicinal potential than the other mushrooms that have currently are currently being tested termites versicolor with cancer is compelling because that definitely shows uh, slightly more people recovering and it's not like a cure for cancer. Everyone doesn't recover. It's like a few percent better. But still, well, these, these mushrooms don't have a lot of the side effects that a pharmaceutical does. So anything that can provably improve survival rates by a few percent without causing bad side effects is a breakthrough. And so that's um, that's really promising. But you know, there's nothing discovered yet that will just cure all cancers or really any medical condition. But there's We'll definitely find more as we do more testing and as more com computer models where you're able to look at a molecule, figure out what you know what its chemical structure is, how it interacts in in the body with a com computer model, and then base your clinical trials on that. Will definitely accelerate the pace of discoveries. Absolutely, but it took so much time to get to that point. It's so hard to think. Now, when I think about the years that I've spent over 20 years not dancing, not moving my body at all, 20 years. Now, during that time, I kept myself super busy. I was a multitasking maniac. <laughs> the pain was there. I was very much aware through all of these things that I was doing that they were so many things that are unresolved and suppressed within my body, within my psyche. The pain of depression was there, but I've always learned some very harsh methodology to deal with that. And that comes from coming from that uh, harsh environment where it was better to suppress and not disclose. That was the way of, of survival. So I was very efficient at that. I took pride at being the person that is not rocked by anything. My father's nickname growing up was a Spartan. I later discovered that a part of my DNA was also Spartan <laughs> and that kept me going. Some of those things that you discover in life just keeps you in that persona. You just develop more of those strong, invincible personas to deal with that pain. But the pain of loneliness, the loneliness, not being able to talk to anyone at that time, especially during the time when I was raising my children, they were in school, a say no to drugs campaign was so strong. I could not even use psychedelics during my worst pain to help myself because of the shame and the stigma. It was so much easier and much more acceptable at that time when my children were in middle school or in even in elementary school to come home and have three glasses of wine and take the prescription medication that the doctor has given me for anxiety and pain. And what, com what, what that combination of medication and alcohol creates in the person is even a deeper cycle of depression, anxiety, and pain. 
And then I've started to see that in my partner. My partner who I was with at the time, ex-husband, was spiraling into opiate addiction. That was the time when opiate addiction hit hard in Southern California, well, in the country as well. And I have watched my ex-husband basically destroy his life with the opiate addiction. Yet we could not legally seek any help in the psychedelic substances as, as any solution at the time. The stigma, the, the, the shame, uh, the overall, the danger of that, having children in the school system. Again, it's not illegal to have a few glasses of wine and prescription medication that your doctor gave you, no matter how much chaos that creates in your body, how much impairment that creates on a daily basis. But using psychedelics was absolutely not an option. Well, that has changed. <laughs> That's basically what it is, you know, just breaking down and building yourself back up for a better you. You know, I, mean, I always tell people, like, why wouldn't you want to be a better version of yourself? I'm not perfect, never try to be. I just try to be better than I was the last moment. And the only way you can recognize who you were last moment, I do believe, is with psychedelics. You know, it's the only time you can actually reflect and look at yourself and your actions and your personality. And that's where it really made sense with me. And so into that, I'm the type of person where I'm very accountable and I want to be accountable for the people around me. I want to be accountable to myself. I don't want to be a burden on anybody. And so to me, psychedelics just anchored my feet to the ground and didn't put me in a space where I felt like somebody is going to gratify me. Something is gratifying me. I am a gratitude piece. And in that, everything I touch is grateful and everything I do is amazing. And so that's something that created in me in psychedelics. And I try to encourage that with anybody I'm working with, that's the intuition to drive into you. It's not about getting over, you know, a terrible relationship or getting over a rape or, or a bad, you know, medical treatment. It's about being grateful and gratitude for your time right now. Uh, and it's amazing and it's loving. And whatever you're doing forward is amazing and loving and the effort is, is pure and, and gratitude. It's, it's so much of a different feeling, especially in today's world where you're so much of an individual that it's so nice to melt into the world of everyone. And, and just to release love. And that's what it does all, the whole psychedelic experience thing has done, I believe for me. To those people who are against or don't know enough about psychedelics and are not wanting people to take them, I would highly advise that you, you know, you yourself look into it more and look at, look at the, uh, the good effects of it. Um, there's many, many drugs out there that they use for um, mental illness and to help people get through these obstacles and they put people in worse places than, the, than they originally started out most of the time and it puts them in places where they're taking multiple medications when you can just take a simple cheap dose of LSD or a microdose of mushrooms and it resets you and in, in sometimes for months. Why not just give it a chance? Why not let somebody have that? freedom in their life again. All right, so the main thing I would like people to understand about psychedelics is just it's, it's an experience that nobody will ever be able to take away from you. It's your own personal experience. And it's something that I believe that every person needs once they access it. Whatever experience you go through is the experience intended for you. Like I would like people to go out and take pictures of mushrooms and put them on the citizen science websites to help document the biodiversity that's out there. So people can understand uh, which mushrooms are out there. And also for conservation, you need to know which mushrooms are out there. There's certainly a lot of undiscovered psilocybin mushrooms that are out there. So if people are going out looking for mushrooms, paying attention to, you know, the mushrooms that they see, they'll, they'll come across some, <clears throat> some new species of psilocybin mushrooms. And those can be studied and named. And when you have named an organism, then you can protect it. We're seeing how the communities are coming together. And that is one of the most unstoppable parts of the psychedelic journey. This definitely creates deeper connections between people. And I think once we're able to establish that, everything else becomes secondary. So the importance of helping people establish that connection with themselves and others and using psychedelics and psychedelic integration as a tool for that is one of the most beautiful hopeful things that, that i can see it's helped me so much in my life i i all i wish is that you know it, it is that people could uh 
could find some peace within themselves. And it's definitely what, it, what I found with the use of psychedelics in my life. I think that I indirectly help people. I think that I help people by sharing my story, by not being afraid to say that like, yeah, I, I experienced hell. I experienced hell and I'm still here, you know? And I've also experienced heaven in this divine love. Does it stay? Not every day, but I, I return. There's hope 